Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Ian Roth. And I'm Tracy McRae. Chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD, is a chronic inflammatory lung disease that causes obstructed airflow from the lungs. Symptoms include breathing difficulty, cough, mucus production, and wheezing. It's a progressive disease caused by long-term exposure to lung irritants, most often from cigarette smoke. Yes, people with COPD are at an increased risk of developing heart disease, lung cancer, and a variety of other conditions. While there is no cure for COPD, recently released guidelines show that treatment options have improved. November is recognized as COPD Awareness Month. I don't know if there's a cake or a card ready for it, but it is Awareness Month. Here to discuss is Mayo Clinic pulmonologist Dr. Paul Scanlon. Welcome to the program, Dr. Scanlon. It's nice to meet you. Good morning. It's nice to be here. So what is it that causes COPD? I've always, like we said in the intro, just thought of it as a cigarette, a smoking-related problem. Uh, in the majority of cases in developed countries, about 80, 80 to 85 percent of people who have COPD have it primarily because of cigarette smoking. It can also be caused by other exposures and as a long-term sequel of asthma and some other conditions. But uh, you can, for all practical purposes, you can think of this as a smoking-related condition in the United States. Uh, in developing countries, it's often a disease attributable to uh, use of biomass fuel burned in the home, mm. either for cooking or for heating. So that's in uh, developing countries. But in, in developed countries, it's primarily related to cigarette smoking. And what, what is actually happening in the lungs when somebody has COPD? Well, the lungs are injured by this long-term exposure to irritants, and so that uh, it can affect the airways, uh, causing uh, mucus hypersecretion and narrowing and bronchospasm in the airways. Um, and it can cause damage to the lung parenchyma, the tissue of the lung, um, uh, causing basically burning holes in your lungs, uh, which is what emphysema is. In it continues. I mean, if you have COPD, I would imagine that there is no cure for COPD. Well, actually, um, in the past, people have been very pessimistic about talking about COPD. This is a long-term, uh, incurable condition mm -hmm. that's uh, you know, uh, relentlessly progressive, et cetera. In fact, um, that pessimism of the past is is pretty much out of date. Um, there's there's excellent treatment for uh, COPD. Uh, the majority of people who have COPD have mild COPD that uh, will get better, or will get better, or stabilize with simply smoking cessation. Um, people who have more advanced COPD are treatable. Uh, it, it is a very treatable condition. So, with appropriate therapy, people even with fairly advanced stage COPD can have improvement in their uh, symptoms: their shortness of breath, their cough, their sputum production. They can improve their quality of life, their exercise tolerance. They can reduce the frequency of exacerbations, which are chest colds that uh, people with COPD can get that cause worsening symptoms. <clears throat> can be life-threatening if severe, um, but are, are treatable, as I said. We'll talk a little bit more about treatment in just a moment, but so then are you saying that the symptoms that make up COPD is just managing those symptoms? Is that what, it, what you do? Um, I'm not sure I understand the question. We, well, what we, are the symptoms? Um, as Ian said, symptoms are shortness of breath or dyspnea, cough, sputum production, and wheezing. Those are the most common symptoms. There are comorbidities or uh, c uh, other conditions that develop in conjunction with this, such as heart disease and lung cancer and other cancers and other comorbidities, uh, which have their own symptoms. But COPD itself is characterized by those symptoms. How would you uh, diagnose COPD? I mean, not everybody who, who has a, a chronic cough would necessarily have COPD, right? How would you know? Right. Um, <clears throat> typically, people who have COPD have those symptoms, and the correct diagnosis is predicated on uh, presence of symptoms, um, certain physical findings, but most importantly, there's a test called spirometry, a lung function test, that in people with COPD shows evidence of airways obstruction. If you don't have airways obstruction, you don't actually have COPD. You might have chronic bronchitis, you might have emphysema, but you don't actually fit the def definition of COPD and don't, uh, we don't treat that as COPD in the absence of air airflow obstruction. Unfortunately, there's been historically fairly sloppy practice in the medical community. People will make a, an erroneous diagnosis of COPD based on symptoms alone 
without measuring lung function, without showing evidence of airflow obstruction. So there's a lot of people that get treated for COPD inappropriately. And likewise, there are also people who have COPD that are never diagnosed because they don't have the appropriate testing done. So there's both overdiagnosis and underdiagnosis. So COPD, emphysema, bronchitis, what are, do those things all, like you said, they get mistakenly diagnosed for each other? There's a Venn diagram, a <laughs> diagram that's overlapping circles. Some people with, many people with emphysema and chronic bronchitis have airflow obstruction. Some actually don't have airflow obstruction. They have other conditions or they can have uh, some degree of emphysema without having much in the way of airflow <laughs> obstruction. Um, so that's kind of fine points of the, mm -hmm. di the definition and the diagnosis, um, which we can go into if you like. If you're a smoker and you know that this is something that could develop over time, I think the tendency for people, they know they should be quitting smoking, but they convince themselves, well, I haven't been smoking long enough to get a disease like COPD or something. How long does it usually take to develop if somebody is a smoker before they start dealing with COPD? Well, it can develop at, at uh, different rates for different people. It's not inevitable. About 50% of people who smoke will eventually develop some evidence of uh, emphysema or chronic bronchitis or COPD airflow obstruction. Um, it's between a quarter and a half of people who smoke who develop COPD. So the, the good news is that not everybody who smokes develops COPD, but they're also at risk of developing uh, lung cancer and uh, heart disease and other comorbidities. Um, so it's not necessarily good news if you smoke and have normal spirometry. That doesn't put, put you off the hook. Everybody who, quit, who smokes should quit. It's the single worst thing you can do for your health. The, uh, growing up, I just always uh, thought that emphysema and COPD, and maybe that's just because that's what my relatives said to told me, you know, mm -hmm. the relatives that smoked, they ended up having one of these different things. So they all kind of got lumped in together as far as I was concerned when I was younger. It, does it make a di What is the difference? I suppose it's solely for treatment to which one that you have. It's that the distinctions between those are sort of fine points that doctors debate about and argue about. But uh, from a practical standpoint for the consumer, the or the smoker or the non-smoker who's concerned about it, um, there, there's enough overlapping that you can think of them as more or less the same. So pe most people who have emphysema have COPD. Most people who have COPD have at least some degree of emphysema. I, I wonder yeah. as we have, when we talk about a lot of topics on this program, but Americans live longer, uh, does that mean that more people are being diagnosed with COPD as we live longer? Uh, it's really a function of how many people smoke. So the good news is fewer people smoke nowadays than in the past. Uh, the peak of the smoking epidemic was in the late 1960s. Since then, the prevalence of smoking in the population has gone from nearly 50% down to the low 20% range. Um, so fewer people smoke, fewer people are at risk of developing COPD. Um, but still, there's millions of people who have COPD who are dealing with it. The good news, uh, and, and, and that is the majority of people who have COPD have mild COPD that is treatable, smoking cessation plus or minus a bronchodilator. On the other hand, people with uh, more advanced stage COPD require more advanced therapy. We've been talking about COPD with Mayo Clinic pulmonologist Dr. Paul Scanlon. We're going to take a short break. When we come back, we'll talk about the treatment and prevention of COPD and Find out the answer to this myth or matter of fact. It's impossible to exercise if you have COPD. We'll find out. Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Ian Roth. And I'm Tracy McRae. We're back talking about COPD with Mayo Clinic pulmonologist Dr. Paul Scanlon. And it's time for the most exciting part of our interview, always the myth or matter of fact question. So Dr. Scanlon, we'll talk about treatment and prediction. So... Uh, treatment and prevention. Let's start with this myth or matter of fact. Exercise is impossible if you have COPD. Is that a myth or a fact? Myth. In <laughs> fact, it's the opposite of the truth. Uh, for people with COPD, uh, exercise is maybe one of the second or third most important things you can do. The most important thing is to quit smoking if you still smoke and to take good care of your lungs. But uh, exercise is very important. It's, an, it's a critical element of a 
a pulmonary rehabilitation program for people who who uh, have COPD, the, uh, along with appropriate medication, uh, regular exercise is one of the most important things they can do to improve their exercise tolerance, improve their quality of life, uh, and improve their general uh, health. I can imagine, though, that uh, a patient says, I can hardly breathe the way it is, and you want me to exercise? Yeah. So how does someone with lung difficulty like COPD, a lung diagnosis like that, go about exercising? In the pulmonary rehabilitation program, we, uh, we train people how to breathe uh, more effectively and breathe better and uh, um, uh, how to treat themselves more appropriately, how to, uh, and, and that includes exercise, how to do staged exercise, starting at what you're capable of and then building up your endurance, and uh, both in terms of distance and time. Excellent. Well, let's talk about those um, guidelines for treatment that have changed a little bit. How have they changed? Oh, there's uh, relatively fine points of, uh, of change in, over the years. The original uh, guidelines came out in 2000, 2001, 2002. Um, they're called the GOLD guidelines. Gold, uh, GOLD is an acronym for Global Initiative for Chronic Obstructive Pulmonary Disease. Uh, and it's a group of experts from the United States and Europe mainly, um, who are mostly pulmonary physicians who uh, review the scientific literature and uh, make a, a recommendations in terms of what is the appropriate details in terms of the diagnosis and treatment both for stable chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and for exacerbations of COPD and what are the important comorbidities uh, the other conditions you need to be concerned about. You kind of mentioned before, but what are some of the other treatment options for somebody who has COPD? Well, the, um, in addition to smoking cessation, which is, as I said, is the most important thing, and I'll repeat that endlessly. It's, you know, it's, it gets, get to the point of being boring, but it's the most important message. Um, there are uh, bronchodilator medications and anti-inflammatory medications that uh, open up the airways, reduce the inflammation in the, in the, the lungs and uh, both uh, uh, improve the performance of the lungs and reduce the likelihood of developing exacerbations. If, if somebody does quit smoking after they've been diagnosed with COPD, is there a chance that COPD would go away? Uh, is this something that you can cure or? It, um, it doesn't actually go away. The, you can look at the lung function over time and um, our lungs grow like the rest of us. So we reach our full lung maturity between age 20 and 25. Lung function is stable between age 20 or 25 and up to about 35 or 40. And after about age 35 or 40, lung function like most bodily function gradually deteriorates over time but it slowly deteriorates to the point that uh, at age 80, 90 or so, most people who have taken good care of their lungs have plenty of good lung function. Uh, the lungs are designed to outlast us. If you smoke and if you're a susceptible smoker, lung function declines more rapidly. So about half of, a quarter to a half of people who smoke uh, have a more rapid decline in lung function and are uh, headed in a trajectory that they'll get into trouble with impaired lung function as they get to a more advanced age. And you asked earlier, at what age can this develop? It can develop as early as age 35 or 40, uh, and most commonly it develops at a somewhat later stage, but 40, 45, 50, 55, 60, and so forth. Um, lung function declines, and, and once you reach that point, the, the lung function is significantly impaired. Now, in answer to your question, can it get better? Uh, the results of the lung health study, of which we were uh, one of the participating centers, showed that um, the, the hypothesis of the lung, fun lung health study was that uh, lung function, if you get people to quit smoking, lung function will stabilize, and that was shown to be the case. Lung function does stabilize and goes down at a much slower rate after smoking cessation. But we also found, uh, interestingly, that lung function does improve a little bit at the time of smoking cessation. So during the first year after quitting smoking, lung function improves a little bit. It's a few percent. Interestingly, it's about twice as much in women as it is in men when they quit smoking. Um, so lung function does improve a little bit, not to normal, but to a little bit better, and then most importantly, stabilizes and dec declines at a normal rate after smoking cessation. Do people with COPD, uh, are they eligible for a lung transplant? L uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease is one of the most common indications for lung transplantation. So 
Uh, it would be nice to say everybody who develops bad COPD can just get a lung transplant, mm -hmm. but in fact, there's a terrible shortage of, of appropriate organs for transplantation. So the number of lung transplants we can do is in very small numbers. Um, so it is a possibility, but it's a relatively uncommon uh, possibility. I would imagine for people who smoke, I mean, you start smoking in this country, you know that you shouldn't be smoking and that it's bad for your health and et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. yada, yada, yada. Mm -hmm. But I would imagine when you start having trouble breathing, serious trouble breathing, that has to be a pretty big encouragement for someone to quit smoking. Do you see that that happens to people with COPD? Well, everybody eventually quits smoking <laughs> by one, by hook or by crook, um, <laughs> by, by desire or not. So. Um, everyone eventually quits smoking and um, we like to encourage people to quit smoking at the earliest possible date before they're symptomatic, before they develop problems. Um, the worse they get, the more motivation there is to quit and we always uh, counsel people to quit smoking as the most important intervention they can do to preserve their health. What, what kind of research is going on on COPD to uh, improve treatments or prevention or what can we hope for in the future? Uh, well, there's quite a bit of research in COPD. The, the, um, uh, the organizations that uh, help promote it the, in the United States, uh, the largest funding source for COPD research is the National Institutes of Health. There are a number of research studies that are done that are funded by pharmaceutical companies uh, testing and trying new, uh, new treatments for COPD. Um, so there's a lot of research going on. Uh, it's reported in the scientific literature by uh, organizations, uh, promoted by organizations such as the American Thoracic Society and the American, Amer um, American Heart Association, interestingly, as an important source of funding for research funds for COPD, um, and the American College of Chest Physicians. So. I love it when we have our awareness months because I get to use my joke about, you know, a cake and a card. But how, how important is something like uh, an awareness month for COPD? I mean, I would imagine family members and patients are very aware of what's going on, but does it help to spread awareness? Yeah, um, awareness always helps um, and uh, kind of highlighting the importance of the appropriate uh, interventions to, to treat, to prevent and treat uh, COPD and other diseases. So sure, it helps. Um, in the end, it's always up to the individual to decide what to do for their health, but uh, a reminder uh, is always worthwhile. All right. Anything else? Okay, go ahead. November is COPD Awareness Month, and we've been talking about treatment and prevention of COPD with Mayo Clinic expert, Dr. Paul Scanlon. Thanks for joining us, Dr. Scanlon. You're welcome. Thanks. It's been great.